nothing but the truth. Hello, I'm Raj Chengapa from India today and your host for Nothing But The Truth. Every week we will deal with key issues of concern and bring you perspectives and clarity as to why these matter to you and what is the clear truth that emerges. In the just concluded India Today conclave, I had moderated a session that was titled India Unbound. The focus was on what is known as the four Ds. The first being democracy, the second demography, the third digitization, and the fourth the trends towards deglobalization. In each of these four Ds, there are revolutions of sort underway in the country that are critical to India's progress. To discuss the challenges ahead, we had two eminent speakers, Amitabh Kant, India's G20 Sherpa and former CEO of Niti Aayog, and PTR Tyagarajan, Tamil Nadu's erudite finance and human resources minister. Their answers to each of the four Ds that I had mentioned were extremely insightful and revealing. So in this episode of Nothing But The Truth, we will examine the progress or the regress that India has made in the four Ds by carrying extracts of what both of them said during the discussion. So let's tune in. PTR, I'm going to start with you on this. Uh, and uh, let's look at the first D, and that is democracy. And India prides itself as the world's largest democracy. And uh, Arun talked about it in, in his opening speech this morning, uh, that uh, we have overtaken China as the most populous country in the world as well. And yet, even as we speak about it, there is a raging debate in parliament, uh, with Rahul Gandhi being censured by the ruling BJP for his critical remarks about Indian democracy when he, he went to the UK recently. Just yesterday, he said that whether I'm allowed to speak or shut up is a test of India's democracy. So, Finance Minister, how do you look, look upon India's democracy? Is it a democracy on the ascent, as the ruling BJP and many others would like to classify it? Or is it on the dissent, as Rahul Gandhi and others describe it, some even calling it an electoral uh, autocracy? Yeah, for me, I think democracy is at the heart of everything, right? I mean, if we go back, and I don't want to sound partisan, so I'm going to talk more philosophically. I'm happy to become partisan if you ask me the right question. But right now, I'll say, I think it is now beyond doubt that democracies where you have strong, independent institutions, where there is a vibrant opposition, where there is accountability, this kind of a democracy, high rates of growth, and good social progress go together. I think that's beyond doubt. There used to be a question, does economic activity drive institutional kind of superiority or the other way around? I think right now we know it's not a chicken and egg problem. The more you have robust, independent institutions, the more you have a vibrant opposition, the more there's accountability, the more likely that you are to get not just a better society, but also a better economy, faster rates of growth. From that perspective, I would have to say that it's not a subjective opinion on almost any scale anywhere in the world that our democracy has not been progressing in the last few years, probably regressing. Independence, are be I mean, institutions are becoming less independent, more uh, kind of aligned with the central axis of power. So I don't want to get into in, in instances, but broadly I would say that the quality of our democracy leaves a lot to be desired and is going in the wrong direction. But let's also get you on what you so-called partisan, but let's see, let's see your views on Rahul Gandhi and what he said and sh should he be censured by the BJP on this? So look, I don't think any party gets the right to censure, right? Either the speaker censures and usually that's for things that are said in the House. What is said outside the House should be kept outside the House. If you exceed the parliamentary code inside the House, the Speaker has the right to make a censure. You cannot take comments made by somebody outside the House, bring that into the House and start making an issue of it, unless you list it as a debate and get everybody to speak. Just because you have a majority, you cannot decide what is an acceptable subject and not an acceptable subject to be debated in the People's House. Right? There has to be some norm. And, and what is your personal views about uh, Rahul Gandhi and what he said? Do you think uh, well, they were defamatory of the country? I, I will restrict myself. Democracy. If it is a democracy, there should be equal opportunity in the House, and the censure or lack of censure should be for things that are said in the House. 
Why should I opine on anybody else's private statement outside the house? Every citizen is entitled to that. That's not subject for political debate, right? At least not in the house. Outside, maybe. But you didn't say, do you agree with him or not? I, it is not my job to have an opinion of what he says. I'm telling you the quality of our democracy is deteriorating, and that's unilateral in most assessments. This particular instance, I don't see it's my job to comment. It's not my day job as a minister, right? Okay. All right. I'm going to come back on, uh, to, to you on democracy. But Amitabh, let's bring you in. You are negotiating with 20 countries under the, the G20. And you've dealt with both demo democratic countries as well as autocratic countries in this. In your opinion, what is the advantages India has as democracy when you compare it with the rest of them? What are the big things that you see? What are the beneficial things? And would you like to also join this debate about freedom of speech and where does this thing end or begin? So I've been uh, negotiating with about uh, 20 plus countries, G20 plus the invitee countries over the last one and a half years now, including uh, the Indonesian presidency. Uh, I think all these uh, countries view India as very lively, as a very vibrant democracy. Uh, for them, uh, the political narrative is important, and they view India uh, from the perspective of the fact that you've got a prime minister who's got democratically elected the second time and has a very high level of uh, acceptance by the public at 70% plus even now, after two and a half years. Uh, secondly, to my mind, democracy is also about the kind of developmental work you've done to transform the lives of citizens in terms of providing electricity, in terms of houses, in terms of uh, roads made, in terms of uh, implementing the aspirational district program in some of the most backward districts of India and change the lives of those citizens. Everything else, to my mind, is is secondary to that. You, within a democratic framework, if you are able to, uh, say, provide uh, 30 million houses, which is like providing a house to every single Australian, you've provided 110 million uh, water connections, which is like uh, providing a water connection to every single German, and you've provided almost 243 million toilets, which is like providing toilets to every single person in Brazil and made 55,000 kilometers of roads in a democratic setup through an electoral process. You've elected people and you've provided uh, 2.5 billion vaccinations all through democratic process by digitalizing your process. That's a great achievement and we should focus on those achievements. You know, I, I, we can actually go through this whole session talking on democracy, but I will circle back to that, this subject again. And let's deal with the other three Ds, because they are also very critical in, in what we're looking at in terms of India's growth. And let's uh, talk about, uh, you know, this is a much talked about subject, the demographic dividend. Uh, now, there is a huge eligible working population, and India is probably going to have the largest because China is declining. And 59% of our population is between the ages 20 to 60, which is the working population. Now, have we exploited, PTR, in your opinion, the advantage that is there? Or is, will this, because we have not done the kind of things that we've done, really become a curse rather than a dividend? Yeah, I think there's a window of opportunity uh, where we will have this kind of uh, average age be in our favor. Places like Tamil Nadu, we're already past that. We're past the peak. Our birth rate is now only about 1.6 TFR. So we're already aging population. Without migrant labor, we cannot function. And that's why we're very conducive and open to it. But as a country, and particularly, and there's a great disparity, right? If you take like the northern states, the TFR is still 3 plus. Uh, in some cases, 3.5 plus. So there, unless you can create job opportunities fast enough, you're going to have a problem. That is very clear. If you look across the span of history, having a lot of unemployed youth is a precursor for social unrest. So I think, uh, at least as far as my state is concerned, uh, we still have a lot more to do, but we are not in a desperate situation where we have a lot of unemployed youth. The youth unemployment rates are probably, you know, in the 10, 12 percent. But if the statistics that I read are accurate around the country as high as 25, 30, higher than that, surely that becomes a problem. Uh, if not now, sooner rather than later, that becomes a problem. So I think 
job creation. For example, in our state, we are focusing a lot on skilling beyond gross education, which is the highest in the country. Enrollment in higher education is double the national average, right? It's 52 percent. Yet we have a lot of people who are not capable of getting employed immediately upon graduation or in the right field and so forth. So we focused a lot since we came to power two years ago on upskilling and finding uh, partnerships where we can pre-certify people in required skills, not just in India, but in places like Australia or Germany, so that we can have uh, a direct employment opportunities in places where there's a shortage of labor, and we can move our people into that high end of the uh, labor spectrum, you know, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars starting wages kind of jobs. No, I'm glad you mentioned skilling, and uh, Amitabh, this is something I'd like to ask you about because if you looked at I mean, critical to this demographic dividend is how much uh, skill manpower you have. And if you looked at the statistics, it shows that compared to other countries, India has barely 3% of its total labor force that has done some kind of vocational training or the others. Whereas if you look at China, it's around 20%. And as you get to developed countries, uh, you know, 40% and above. What does India need to do? You were head of Niti Aayog. You had handled a lot of these issues. Why haven't we moved quickly enough? Because the demographic dividend, according to experts, began from 2010 onwards. And we knew it was coming. Did we fall behind? And what needs to be done now? Uh, so Raj, uh, important point is uh, that uh, out of a population of 1.4 billion, we still have uh, uh, a billion plus people below the age of 35. And the demographic dividend, if you look at entire India, the average age will be about 29 right till 2070. So you will have a very young India. But uh, critical to what you said is that you need to create formal jobs. Uh, you can't be growing at very high rates of 9 to 10% with 42% of your population dependent on agriculture. So you need to move population from agriculture to very sustainable urbanization. And I'm a great believer that urbanization creates better quality of life. It's a center of innovation. It's a center of growth. And it enables you to create good formal jobs. Uh, it's very, very important that many states, and uh, particularly the eastern part of India, uh, need to use, do this manufacturing-led urbanization. And that's very critical in the days to come. So many of these things, to my mind, uh, improving learning outcomes, health outcomes, uh, the government of India has done a lot on several of these issues in terms of a new education policy, but we must realize that several of these subjects are state subjects. We are a very large country. We are bigger than 25 countries of Europe. Every state has to deliver on learning outcomes and health outcomes, and much like the southern part of India has done. And these states need to excel on skilling. Uh, because that's a massive opportunity, and they need to really push the limits on good manufacturing-led urbanization, and that will create the right quality of jobs. But there's a massive opportunity of actually providing 25 to 30 percent of the workforce of the world by 2070 to the rest of the world from India, and that's a massive opportunity in terms of skilling. Now, shouldn't uh, you mention that it, uh, you know, skilling is a education is a state subject, shouldn't industry start moving on it? Shouldn't there be this matching thing that's to happen? And look, the Modi government is now going to be nine years old. They, they actually did a good thing by combining human resources with skill development. Otherwise, they're separate ministries. Why hasn't that worked? I mean, it's nine years, and you should have had one generation coming out from that, or many, if you're just doing vocational education. Uh, so the objective was that when you train people, you skill them through the private sector to the industry councils. The objective was that the private sector will pay a higher wage to the skilled worker rather than the informal worker. And industry should pay that because you're getting a skilled worker. That ability of the industries to pay a much higher wage level to the skilled worker hasn't actually happened in reality. And I think it's for the industry associations to really push for that in a very big way. Because a person who spent time on getting skilled must get a higher wage rate. And that is what has happened in Germany. That is what has happened in all areas, in all countries where skilled workers were really used as apprentices in the manufacturing process. No, I, I mean, we could have also dealt with this in much detail, but let's move to the third D, which is digitization. 
And here, India certainly leaps ahead of others in terms of bridging the digital divide, and we've seen that. Uh, there's this old saying that earlier, we used to have uh, more temples than toilets. Uh, now we had, and then the stage came where we had more toilets than temples after the Swachh Bharat scheme. But now we seem to have more uh, mobile phones and cell phones than toilets and temples. So there is a revolution that's there. And uh, Amitabh, maybe you could begin, and then PTR, I'll get you onto this. What is, what can we, how can we leverage this phenomenal thing that's happening? And where's the great advantage we have? So, uh, Raj, my belief is that it's a remarkable story. It's very unlike the big tech model of uh, United States where Google, Microsoft, Apple led the revolution with their own citizens' data. It's very different from the GDPR model of Europe where they laid emphasis on privacy but not on uh, innovation and therefore innovation has got impacted in Europe. But in India, we built up digital identity for every Indian. And between 2015 and 2017, we opened 500 million bank accounts. That means 55% of the bank accounts during that period were opened in India. Every second bank account was opened in India. We ceded the digital identity, Aadhaar, and your mobile number to that. And therefore, Indians started doing fast payments from their mobile. I've not used my debit card, credit card. I've not been to a bank. I've not used my ATM machine. For the last four years, my mobile is my virtual bank. And India does 11x more digital payments than what United States and Europe does. We do 4x more digital payments than what China does. It's a huge story. Doing 2.5 billion vaccination totally paperless, cashless, digital uh, during the COVID period is a remarkable story. And building up Diksha and Swayam and all this, uh, because these are open source model, these are open APIs, they are interoperable on top of which the private sector innovates. India is the only country where phone pay competes with Google pay in the market space. India is the only country where Paytm compete with WhatsApp in the marketplace and 40 apps compete with each other. So this is a remarkable story. The challenge is that if you look around the world, there are 4 billion people without a digital identity. There are 2 billion people without a bank account. There are 133 countries which do not even have a digital payment mechanism, a fast payment mechanism. And this model which India has built up, to my mind, is the future of the world. Most tech innovations in the past have come from the developed world, but this is a model built by India. And this model needs to be taken as a business model across the world and to change the lives of citizens in many countries of the world. I think we should applaud, him for, uh, applaud India for that, let's put it that way. Amazing work. Uh, PTR, coming to you. Your chief minister is known as the dashboard chief minister. He has a dashboard where he tracks every single development that's happening across it. How can a state like Tamil Nadu leverage that? What is the advantages and what are the disadvantages? Have you seen any lacuna that you find that needs correction? So, uh, let me answer this more as a former banker than anything else. While I agree with the notions and the ideas that uh, my friend has stated here, in the parliament, I think, a few days ago, there was a reply that the cash in circulation today is twice what it was at the time of uh, demonetization, twice in actual value. So something is not quite universal. I, I agree. I was a banker. I've seen what uh, electronic transformation can do. It is as good or better than in any other country. The RBI has a lot of credit for this. This was true even 10 years ago. The payment model in, in India was or 20 years ago, better than most countries. Where we have a problem is there is still a divide, and that is in a state like Tamil Nadu, which is the most urbanized state in the country. 50% of all people live in cities, and yet we don't have as good access. We are just going to announce in this budget a special program to provide last mile access to the villages and to everybody. So first of all, access is not universal. Second, a lot of people don't have the basic kind of capacity, so we've moved a lot of our things online. You see, when you have a lot of people-to-people -people interactions, there's room for rent-seeking, malfeasance, all kinds of complexity. So we moved a lot of services online, including getting like your life certificate for your pension, including getting your other government documents and so forth. And uh, we found some people just don't have the capacity to reach uh, through the online portal, particularly the older, poorer people right. don't have access yet. So we have now found mechanisms to take the service to their house. So, you know, some, you, we have to be a bit thoughtful. There is still a digital divide, maybe not nearly as bad as it used to be. 
but in our government we are trying our best to first get everybody online second move as many services as possible online and remove the need for physical buildings for personal interaction for any kind of downside that arises from it but i think uh, somewhere in the total payment model as good as we are we still need to get a lot better because the volume of cash for example let's give let's give the contrast when i was a banker uh, globally in kenya when vodafone announced the mpesa within something like 5 years 65% of the economy was transacting on one platform right so i think that level of reach we have still not got so there's room for us to improve particularly through inclusion and uh, better access and training in remote areas urbanization will fix a lot of problems but you'll always have rural areas so you still got to have some program for that well i could have continued but we have barely uh, less than 5 minutes for the fourth d and i think this is a very important d because we are looking at a massive trend they say of deglobalization and uh, many thought it was because of covid but studies show that even before covid set in you had this process of deglobalization happen starting from uh, 2011 and uh, the economists talked uh, talked of it and called it globalization uh, and uh, more currently we are not looking at a total deglobalization but maybe a regionalization that they call it so amitabh you've been dealing with g20 countries this is something that india is very you know india has advantages it it has just moved into the globalization phase wants to benefit from, from all the foreign exchange that's coming in plus uh, the, the supply chains and yet there is a regressive movement countries are becoming insular and protectionist what does india need to do uh, you know raj i am a believer that india needs to grow at rapid rates we need to grow at 8% plus for the next three decades year after year year after year to be able to lift a very young population above the poverty line but that would require us to be productively very very efficient become very competitive and penetrate global markets and exports so what has happened in the world is that the global value chains have got disrupted and the global value chains were very uh, coupled with one country uh, well, let me not use the word decoupling but there there was a monopoly built up so if you look at the top manufacturers of the world uh in several areas 90% plus production was happening in one country now because of geopolitics there is going to be a breakdown of that and therefore this is also an opportunity this is a huge opportunity for other countries including india and india has demonstrated its ability to attract investments our fdis have grown apple samsung all of them are manufacturing so we need to get into sunrise areas of growth these are the areas which are going to drive economies of the future whether it's electric mobility whether it's battery storage whether it's uh, mobile manufacturing the whole world is going to see a massive amount of disruption in a vast range of sunrise areas of growth but let me also tell you that globalization has lifted vast segments of population above the poverty line across the world and therefore there is if you want to make a difference to the world and actually accelerate the pace of growth and it's important to understand this because one third of the world is under recession right now 75 countries of the world are facing a global debt crisis so the world needs to grow and the answer to that is good globalization by demonopolizing production and opening up the opportunities for many other countries of the world and therefore countries like india must focus on becoming as we've done so far becoming more and more productively efficient and attracting investments from all over the world this is our opportunity this is a huge huge opportunity this is a once in a lifetime opportunity we should never lose this opportunity but you also i'm i'm coming to you peter but uh, amitabh i just like to finish this you also have this trend what they call maga make america great again which uh, trump talked of right which and we also have make in india and if we try to uh, make a acronym of that it would be mega make india great again now how do you resolve this contradiction on one side you're saying let's globalize let's uh, uh, you know uh, exploit the value chains on the other side let's make in india you start protecting your domestic industry america is doing that how do you resolve this contradiction let me first say that when make in india was designed and you go back and look at those principles it was never meant to be protectionist it was meant to make india competitive and make india very integral part of the global value chain very very integral to the global value chain whereas if you look at the united states new acts 
Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, some of them seem to be, look to be very protectionist in nature. They say that we'll give you subsidy if you make an America. That has never been the case. What we are saying is, even with the production-linked incentive scheme, what we are saying is that you go bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger for the next five years and penetrate global markets. So Apple is manufacturing not for the domestic market here. It's doing it so that it can export more and more. And that is what we've done. We said you go and penetrate global markets. I'm glad you mentioned Apple and that I, I want to bring you into this, Peter. How do you do, view this trend of deglobalization? Tamil Nadu has benefited. I mean, Apple is uh, in many ways moving out of China, if you want to call it regionalization, and coming and setting up its largest factories in your state. I'm not sure what I can say in five seconds. <laughs> no, yeah. we'll give you a, <laughs> a minute. <laughs> Well, I, I think there are four or five things here. First, we should remember that globalization is secular, but at a global, at a kind of historic level, it's also cyclical. There used to be the age of empire, there used to be the age of Roman Empire, colonialism. So the extent of globalization actually goes up and down. It's not, you know, always going up. In 20 years, 30 years, going one way, then goes the other way, then comes the other. Second, the overall volume of globalization doesn't kind of... Uh, discriminate between bilateral trade or the shift away from China towards India uh, that our colleague is talking about. So I think there are a lot of opportunities. Third, the value of globalization is inarguable. Mathematically, you will show that the more there is uh, barrier-free trade and access, you will get greater growth. No question. The downside of globalization is unless governments are particularly focused on it, such rapid increase in growth will also lead to increases in inequality and stratification of society, and you're likely to find a lot of people get disgruntled, as you're seeing in the Western economies, because people at the lower level of skill have completely lost out on the benefits of globalization, and big investment bankers and corporates did really well. So you have to do it carefully. But I completely agree in an overall perspective that this is a wonderful opportunity. I can't think of a better time for India as a country, given the macro trends around liquidity still being quite high, around the de-risk China kind of uh, uh, movement, around the geopolitical instability everywhere else. This ought to be India's moment. What worries me, and this includes me as Tamil Nadu, I'm not just talking about the, the union government. What worries me is, are we doing enough to actually capture this opportunity, and are we dedicating the right level of attention and resources because this window won't stay open forever. And execution as right. well. And, and so, you know, it is a golden moment, probably better than any other time. Are we doing enough? I'm not that comfortable. I think there's a lot more we should do and we need to grasp the moment while it's there. Well, finally, there's a conclave moment that we talk about and we have just 30 seconds for that, which is uh, I'm looping right back to democracy because democracy is central. Without it, this nation will not uh, drive itself at all. And uh, so, Amitabh, I'll come to you first. What is it that you like best about Indian democracy, and what is it that you'd like to change about Indian democracy? I think uh, the election process, I mean, at that size and scale, a billion people voting. You go to Gee Land, there are 40 tigers, there's one human citizen there. And the election machine goes there to get his vote. Or you go to Siachen, where f just the soldiers, you go and people vote there. I mean, no democracy in the world provides you this process of election, voting for elections, which Indian ele electoral process does. It's a matter of immense pride that we are a vibrant, lively democracy of this nature. And what is it that you'd like to improve, change, I would or dislike have, about Indian no, I'm a great believer in social indices. I would like to see that all these states need to improve education, health, nutrition, which are very critical for long-term growth of India. And PTR, what is it that you like most about Indian democracy and what is it that you don't like about Indian democracy? I like its diversity. I like that it has so much scale. Uh, I'll just give you one example. I was at the Indian Express or some conclave and they said, you're a leading voice of dissent in India. And I said, it's awkward that the finance minister of a large industrialized state who ought to be the system is seen as a dissenter. It says something is structurally wrong. So I like that it's got that much diversity. And that is great, and you know, for the scale of our country, that's wonderful. I would like to see a lot more independent, strong institutions holding, including people like me, accountable. Holding all those in power accountable to a greater degree than we have now. As you could see, both speakers had significant points to make 
on each of the four Ds. I hope you enjoyed the session and I look forward to being with you next week. Nothing but the truth. <laughs>